Welcome back, everybody. As we discuss on this teaching, we're going to look at what it means to uh, light up the darkness. Now, this whole thing came out of uh, a, a prayer call that we did, a prayer Zoom call with JGN leaders from around the world. And uh, I just felt that we needed to speak light and be light and explain what it means and all that. So we had JGLM leaders from around the world get on a prayer call on New Year's Eve, actually. So we started at 1030 local time and went right into about 1230. So about a two hour prayer call. There was there was discussion and there was there was corporate prayer. There was praying for healing and, you know, all that uh, deliverance and all that. Um, but it was really a call to light up the darkness and to show people, you know, who we are in Christ. And because of who we are, we have that light and we need to be that light to the world. We can't hide. We cannot hide. If the world, um, if, if we hide from the world, then what hope does the world have? We are that hope. So this is why we need to look at this and, and bring this up. But it came out of uh, that prayer call. I called it Light Up the Darkness. Um, that was kind of our theme, if you will, because um, it's so vitally important. So let's dive right into Scripture here. Uh, this is most likely going to be a two-part series, and uh, I hope it helps you guys. So we're going to turn right away to John eight twelve. John eight twelve says, Then spoke Jesus unto them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He, so anybody, that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And, and it goes on to say that Jesus was the, the light of life unto all men. So he is your light. So if that light lives in you, you should not be walking in darkness. Well, what's part of darkness? Sin. What's part of darkness? Death, disease, destruction, all these different things. That's part of darkness. We should not be walking in darkness. We should be the light, be walking in light. So when somebody looks at you, they say, well, there's something, I, I want what you have. But if they have what you have, death, destruction, disease, things like that, why would they want what you have if they've already got it? What they need is healing, life, prosperity, and, and again, prosperity doesn't just need money. I mean, prosperity, prospering in your soul, um, prospering in your emotions, just prospering in joy and love and peace and all these different things. That's what they want to see. And that's what they need to see. And that's when they need to be, right? So we need to be, that's part of the light. And a part, part of that is not walking in any of those things. Who knows that depression is, is um, darkness? I mean, you talk about uh, I, I've talked to a lot of people and they talk about how depression is so dark for them. I mean, it's just dark, 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 depending on how deep that depression goes. So a lot of people are just, they're so afraid of the dark too. Um, a lot of people have bad sleeps. A lot of people fear the dark. Um, well, you shouldn't fear the dark because you should be the light and you shouldn't fear. You know, most people fear the dark because of the scary things that apparently live in the dark. Well, you shouldn't be afraid of them. They should be afraid of you. This is all part of this. So... You will not walk in darkness if you're part of that light, okay? Now, uh, Matthew 5, 13 through 17 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses, has lost its savior, or savor, sorry, wherewith shall it be salted? So if, 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 if the salt of the earth, the Christians, lost their, their flavor, if you will, wherewith can it be salted again? It is henceforth are thenceforth good for nothing. Okay? So, what this is saying is if a Christian has lost its has lost their their flavor, uh, they've lost their their uh savor, if they've lost their the you know the good tasting sweet words of Jesus so to speak, what is it good for? It's good for nothing. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I'm saying, it's what the Bible says. If you've lost your salt, if you've lost that taste, right? then what good are you? That's what the Bible says. And they're henceforth good for nothing. Those are strong words, but those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Do you see that? So if, if we're not living the proper Christian life, we can be cast out and we can be trodden under the foot of men. Right? Because we're going to succumb to that. We're going to succumb to their thoughts and their wills and things like that. But if we stand strong and we don't lose our, our, our flavor, if you will, the sweet words of the Lord, that word is abiding in us, then the Bible doesn't have to say to us, hey, you're good for nothing. But that's what it says. Okay? Now let's move on. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Which means what? Christians should not hide. 
Christians should not be cowering under persecution, under trouble, under you know different rules and regulations of the government and things like that that are completely unconstitutional. The Christians should be should be standing strong. But so many churches are closing. So many people aren't meeting together. You should be meeting together. Okay, maybe not be broadcasting it all over the world, but you should be meeting together. Why? Because the Bible says, um, don't stop meeting together, especially when you see the time approaching. Right. So in these times, we're supposed to be getting together, not hiding. So what? 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 What's there, what? What good does it have to an underground church on Zoom? That's not an underground church, right? Underground church is getting together, meeting together with like-minded fellow uh, believers in God, one-minded, um, single-minded, one vision, one goal, walking together and saying, look, we will not let anybody uh, take our, our, our Christianity from us, okay? But we have way too many people hiding, way too many people afraid to meet. Um, and listen, the world, this isn't the first time the Christians have come against something like this. This is just something new with a different name, okay? The devil has nothing new. He just might have a different name, okay? They, there was tons of persecution back then. There were, look at the people in the upper room. There was 120 people in the upper room with a, in a closed door meeting. Why? Because they were afraid of the religious leaders, but they were still meeting, praying of one accord, of one mind, and then the Holy Spirit fell on them. Now we're running from the government because of COVID, you know, and people aren't getting together. So you see, the church has always been under this thing. This is nothing new, but the church, unfortunately, right now, the church is not really thriving in it uh, in a lot of ways. Some are, some aren't, because they're running away hiding, okay? Thank the Lord that the church didn't run and hide back then, because maybe we wouldn't have had the day of Pentecost, okay, if they, if they had to run. We wouldn't have the things that, that Paul said, who wrote almost two-thirds, around two-thirds of the New Testament, because he would have he would have stayed quiet and he would have he would have hid himself instead of being vocal and preaching the gospel. You know, some of the apostles and the disciples, when they came out from getting beaten, they went into the streets and kept preaching, counting it worthy that they suffer persecution for the word of God. They didn't run and hide. And we have far too many people running and hiding at this point in time. Um, verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Okay? Uh, I can't stress it enough, guys. The church was under persecution. They met in homes. That's what life teams are. Constantly meeting in homes, under persecution, under the risk of trouble, under the risk of their very own life and safety, they kept meeting. And we look at that in the Word of God and we say, oh, blessed those guys, they're, they're, their faith was amazing, how strong they were, uh, all this stuff. Yet we're supposed to be the same example to the world. We're supposed to be still meeting together because that's what the Word of God says. But so many people have stopped meeting together uh, because of this whole thing. And, and the early church had something that, that the church doesn't have today. That grit, that determination, we just did a teaching on that. Um, that grit, that determination, the perseverance to stand up for what's right. Um, so they can't do it. If you don't stand up for what's right, they're going to keep taking, 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 taking. So I encourage people to get together. I encourage people to meet in their homes and different places, wherever they can, to meet, to get together once in a while. I get that Zoom is good in certain fashions. Um, but Zoom doesn't follow, you know, any kind of video chatting, not just Zoom in general, but, but, but you know, Getting together with with another like-minded person, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, gather together, speaking and, and teaching and admonishing one another in the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. You can't get that same level of admonishing and encouragement and, and brotherly and sisterly love off, off a video chat. It doesn't work. I get that it has a place. So when we do seminars and, and things like this, I get that we can reach the masses this way, okay? But discipleship really comes from that close connection you have with the people that are around you and you're pouring yourself into them. You cannot effectively pour yourself into somebody uh, on video, okay? So we do these things to, to reach the world. We, we, we do the Zoom conferences and things. To um, The last one we did, we, we reached Alaska to New Zealand to Africa, uh, in China, and all these different places. So that's why we do that, to get the Word of God spread out. But that, that's training. That's not really discipleship. Getting together one-on-one -on -one with people is discipleship, or in a group of three or four or five or six or whatever. That's discipleship. But you can't do that over video chat. 
So I strongly encourage people to get together. Okay? Now, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, some people say, well, you, you, you can't let, let anybody see your good works because God's going to get mad at you. No, the Word of God says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works. Okay? Now, this is not what, what, what the Bible warns you about is being boastful, being proud by saying, look what I'm doing and what are you doing? That's where the problem is. But, but doing it just to show off, that's a problem. Doing it and have people notice what you're doing, that's what God wants. And then um, it brings glory to God. Because your the goodness of God leads men to repentance. The goodness of God um, is feeding people, is, is helping people. So, you know, you don't do that stuff in secret. You help people and people will see that and want to join on with you. Verse 17, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay, so John chapter 1, verse 3, verses 3 through 5. All things were made by him, talking about Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. And all things were made by him. Oh, sorry. And in him, verse 4, and in him was life. And the life was the light of men. I, I mentioned that a little while ago. In him was life. And life was the light of men. Do you see that? So people, get this. The, the world talks about you know us being lights. And, and let that light shine. Listen, you cannot light, let your light shine if you don't have the light in you. Okay? People who don't have Jesus don't have the light. Period. They assume they have light, but that light is actually darkness. And and the Bible talks about that. And if 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 you think your 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 you know your your light is shining, but it's really darkness, how great that darkness actually is. And that's where the world is. You know, you find your inner peace and 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 be the best version of you and 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 you know be one with the universe and all these other different things. Okay, that is not light. That is absolute darkness. Okay, it's just guised as light. But this says that he was the light, the life, the light of men. So without him, there is no light. It is only darkness. Verse five, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so when you go to a place that's full of darkness the world will hate you the bible says why because it first hated him so when you go in there as light the world may hate you because it can't comprehend the light that's within you you ever meet somebody who just doesn't like you for no reason or they talk bad about you no reason you haven't done anything wrong to them you've never had an argument uh, you don't have a bad reputation and yet they don't like you it's because of what's in you uh what's in them doesn't like what's in you Okay, that's oftentimes the way it is. Now, this is saying that Jesus was the light of all men. And because of that light, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't comprehend it. Okay, but we need to walk in that light and be that light to all men. We have to let our light shine so brightly, so strongly. And it's, it's not that God automatically lets our light shine. The Bible says you let your light so shine. So it's a choice whether you hide that or you become that thing, right? Now, there's some discipline involved in this where you have to, you know, learn how to be that and build this perseverance and everything like that. So get rid of fear. But this is how we're supposed to be living. So if there's any darkness around you, when you walk into that, it's lit up. And somebody's like, man, that person is a room changer. Okay, now for the good reasons, not for the bad reasons. John three eighteen through 20. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. What, what do you mean? God condemns people? Uh, yeah, that's what the word of God says. If you believe, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe, you are already condemned. That's what the word of God says. Now, what is what does the word believe mean? The word believe does not simply mean I said a prayer, I, I went up to the front for an altar call, I quickly slipped up my hand, I repeated the sinner's prayer, which isn't biblical anyway, um, therefore I'm a believer. That is not true. 
okay? Your works show that you're saved. And what I mean by works is not your religious works, but the fruit of your life, how you're living your life. Are you walking around as light? Are you changed? Have you repented? Has your life completely changed and moved away from what it was? That's what this is talking about here, um, b- about being believed. The word believe really means to entrust, someone who entrusts somebody else. So most Christians don't trust God. Every Christian believes in God, but not every Christian believes God. That's the difference, okay, between this. Um, so you've got to believe and trust him and know who he is. It is not just a simple confession. It's also believing in your heart and living because there's fruit behind salvation. So he that believes is not condemned, but he who believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. In the name. You've got to believe in Jesus Christ. I don't care. You, you can't believe in Mary. Okay. Was Mary the mother of Jesus? Yes. But she was a human being, not a savior. Okay, not an angel, not the Virgin Mary. I got news. Mary had other children. Jesus had brothers and sisters. She's not the Virgin. All right. She was, but she's not now. Okay. She wasn't after Jesus was born and then she had some brothers and sisters. He had some brothers and sisters. She wasn't a virgin. So we don't pray to Mary. We don't we don't bow down to Mary. We don't we don't say hail Mary's. We don't do any of this thing. That's all that stuff's all false. It's Jesus, believing in the name of Jesus, not Peter, not Paul, not Mary, not any of the saints, none of that. It is Jesus Christ, okay? And this is often why I use the name Jesus so much, because when you say, well, I believe in God, and people say, oh, amen, I believe in God too. Okay, what God are you talking about? Because my God and your God are probably two totally separate things, but you got to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That's what has to happen. Now, um, and this, so going on verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that the light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Look at the world right now. We're in that state, and unfortunately the world's been in that state for a long time, but it just seems to be so prevalent right now that, that the devil's not even hiding anymore, really, you know? It says that light is come into the world, and the men, so Jesus came into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. See, so many people have, 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 you know, given their lives to the Lord and then became a reprobate and they turned around and they walked away from the Lord. Yes, you can walk away from the Lord. Once saved, always saved is false doctrine. Well, what happens, you know, God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That is true. But it does not say that you can't walk away from him. And many people have had, the Bible says they've walked away from the faith. Well, how can you walk away from somewhere you never were? So once saved, always saved is completely and utterly false. People use that to get away with sin and say, well, once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter. And that's simply not true. But these people loved darkness rather than light. They loved their their wrong deeds. They they, they hated uh, good and they love evil. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. God hates evil. Therefore, we should hate evil. Then it goes on to verse 20. It says, For everyone that does evil hates the light. What's evil? Sin. Everyone that hates or that does evil does sin, commits sin, habitual sin, hates the light. And who's the light? Jesus Christ. So when somebody's willfully sinning, it's hatred towards the Lord. Now, people, man, people don't like this stuff. But it's what it says. Neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. See, people don't want to be reproved. People don't want to be convicted. People don't want to, you know, um, they want to live their life how they want to live their life. And you don't tell me what to do. What's, what's one of the greatest things out there? Or what well, greatest phrases, I guess. Don't judge me. The Bible says judge not. Yeah, well, read the rest of Matthew chapter 7. Okay, it's talking about a hypocritical judgment, but people, they know that scripture really well. The first two words of that, Matthew chapter seven, judge not, right? So people say, hey, brother or sister, you're not, you're not living right. Judge me not. Why are you judging me? Well, because the Bible says that if you see a brother or sister um, in a sin, you should go correct them. It's what it says. It doesn't say to ignore it. So people pull that out of context all the time to say, I want to live how I want to live and you can't say anything about it. Well, the Bible tells us to say something about it to save their souls, 
right? Okay. Um, Acts 13, 46 through 48. Acts 13, 46 through 48 says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, got bold, got strong, right? You, you gotta think that. Waxed bold, which means what? They got strong and they stood up and said, It was not necessary that the word, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, though we turn to the Gentiles. So what, what, who's he talking to? He's talking to the religious people, the, you know, the Jewish people. And what is he saying? He says, listen, you judge yourselves unworthy. Okay? So when we don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept his free gift of salvation, which was not free to him, which is free to us, but it wasn't free to him, it cost him his life, and it wasn't free to God either because it cost him his son, you actually... Judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. So that's why they were turning to the Gentiles. The gospel had to come first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. But the Jews rejected Jesus and Jesus turned the whole thing over to the Gentiles. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. But they judged themselves unworthy to ever everlasting life because they had a religious mindset that said, look at us, we are God's chosen people. And that is true, um, but they don't get an immediate pass. They don't get a, a free pass into heaven. They got to still believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So this says that if you don't accept it, if you don't believe it, you judge yourself unworthy uh, and, and you condemn yourself, basically. Verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. You see that? They were glad and they glorified in the word of the Lord saying, what you too Gentiles can be saved. God can save anybody. It's just a matter of turning your heart and your life over and accepting and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 17 through 18. Delivering thee from people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power or influence, if you will, of Satan, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So our faith has to be in the Lord. We get sanctified. We get an inheritance. We receive forgiveness because we are moved from the the, um, the the authority or not the authority the the influence really uh, of the devil. Well, it's kind of authority because when when you're not saved, the, the devil kind of has authority in your life. Um, but when you're saved, he certainly doesn't. When you're not saved, he sort of does. When he when you're when you are saved, he doesn't. But this says that um, you were moved from the power of Satan. Why? Because you were you turned from darkness to light. Darkness is Satan. Light is God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So you were translated out of the influence of the devil, the darkness, into the and, and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That's what this is talking about, too. You move from that darkness into that light. That's amazing. It's amazing to me. Uh the the, the pure amazing gift of God of salvation. It's the greatest miracle uh, that ever was. That, that an all-knowing God is willing to put himself in us fickle people is, is, is simply out, uh, outstanding. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5. Listen, get this in you. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. What does that mean? If you're hiding that gospel inside of you, if you're not letting that light shine, it's hidden to those who are lost. You know, it, it, it's hidden to those who are wandering around in a, in a dark desert, in a dark wilderness, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go. And we're hiding our light. It, it, it's, it's like finding a, a group of people and they're struggling and they're afraid and they're starving and, 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 and I mean, they're broken and they've been out in the woods for days or months or years. And you got a million watt 
candle what whatever it's called candlelight flashlight in your hand and you're not willing to turn the light on to help them find their way that's who we need to be we need to be that light that lights up the pathway and says look follow me to your freedom follow me to your destiny that's what we need to be and that's who we need to be but if the gospel is hid it is hid to them that are lost so you can still be found and still have that, that light hidden in you. But you've got to live your life in such a manner that the gospel has no choice but to come out of you. Do you see that? That's what needs to take place. So the gospel has no choice but to come out of you because it's in you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's in every part of your life. And the gospel, it just flows from you. That's what needs to happen. That's like, light doesn't need to try. Light just is. So we don't need to try to be Christians. We just are, right? But, we, we, but if we hide that thing, then we're not being who we're supposed to be. Verse four, in whom the God of this world had blinded the, who has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So people who've believed not or don't believe or non-believers, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded them. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Which means what? That is where you put, where you come into play. Where you share the gospel. And your life is the greatest testimony that you will ever have. Your life is the greatest ministry. Your life is an epistle being written daily as long as you're, you're, as long as you're following the Lord and you're walking in the Lord. Your life is an epistle. And that light of the glorious gospel of Christ that's in you, who is the image of God, Jesus, so that image is in you, should shine upon them, doing what? You letting your light shine. Not hiding the gospel, because if you hide it, it's hidden unto those. Let me ask you this. What happens? See, everybody was preached to at one point in time. It was my grandma Betty that spoke to me in, when I was 12 years old and introduced me to this guy named Jesus. And now, uh, you know, I gave my life to the Lord at that time, but I didn't follow it, so I wouldn't consider myself a Christian through those times. Because I, did, I, didn't, I didn't follow it, I didn't do anything with it. But everybody usually had a, a praying somebody. Somebody had them share the gospel with them at some point in time. And that's why you turned, okay? Now, I, I know that God got a hold of some people on his own and all that other kind of stuff. But generally speaking, it was through a sermon, through an evangelist, through a preacher, through a friend, through a family member, sharing the good word with you. Now, if that's the case, what happens if that person hid the gospel? You may not be saved. What happens, you know, if you hid the gospel in yourself and you've got people saved, then they wouldn't be saved and they'd be going to hell. Do you see why this is so vitally important uh, to believe that in us? Uh, we've got to finish up this session here, but uh, verse 5 says, For we preach not of ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Okay? Now, that's talking about the light. There's many more scriptures, but I want to get into on this next session about what it means to live in the light. Not just be the light, but what does it mean to live in the light, okay? Because you have to live in something um, and know who you are. The, the more you know who you are, um, the, the brighter your light will shine, okay? Um, because you can't hide that. That when, when, when you have that knowledge, when you have that joy, when you have that thing within you, you can't help but hide it because it just flows from you. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generals, self-control, temper, all those things, they flow from you and it's, it's, it's first nature to you because that's actually your nature, okay? Now, um, if, if you don't figure this out, you will just be a a degree of who you're supposed to be. We need to know that we are the light. He is the light. He lives in us. How we're supposed to walk in it. We're supposed to let our light shine. And the best way to do that is to absolutely be overflowing with the Word of God. With, with the truth of the Word of God. Not listening to 300 different sermons a day um, and, and, and listening to 50 different teachers or something. That's going to confuse you. Find a teacher that speaks truth, that speaks the Bible, and live that thing out in your life. And you watch how people will change around you and act around you because that light is emanating from you. Okay, That's how this thing works. But we're going to let you go for now. Uh, tune in again on our, on our second session. It'll be, it'll be, this will be a two-part series. Uh, but the next part will be living in the light as 
the light of the world. So how do we live in this? Stay tuned. We'll come back at you um, right next week. God bless you guys.